Welcome to this lecture where we're going to take a look at how the United States went from being a bystander nation, sitting on the sidelines, not wanting to get involved in World War II, to actually being a participant or a belligerent power. So let's get this thing started. Um, what you need to realize is there was a lot of a bitterness in the United States regarding our participation in the First World War. Um, World War I was looked upon as a mistake amongst a lot of Americans. In fact, in 1934 to 1936, you have something called the Nye Commission. And I know what you're thinking, Bill Nye, the science guy, awesome, I love him. No, actually, someone even more popular, the Republican Senator, Gerald Nye. And basically what this uh, Senate committee came up with was in their investigation, they basically determined in, in looking at the causes of World War I, why America entered into it, they came up with the conclusion that it was the result of hey, must be the money. Money. Hey, money. They basically said that American bankers and arms manufacturers, weapons manufacturers, cause U.S. entry into World War One. that the reason we got dragged into this thing was because of economic factors, that some people made a lot of money off the war and that this was the main reason, um, not those things that Wilson talked about, making the world safe for democracy, the war to end all wars, that was all hogwash. This was a mistake. In fact, in 1937, they did a poll, 70% of Americans thought we should have stayed the heck out of World War One. So the Nye Commission kind of enforces what people felt World War I was a mistake. And if you remember, there were all those writers during the 1920s, the lost generation, who, who wrote about the kind of insanity of this war, and people just wanted to avoid it altogether. Here's what happens. Even before World War II breaks out, Congress, the legislative branch of the U.S. government, legislates neutrality. They pass laws to guarantee that if a war breaks out, that the United States will avoid it. And there's a couple of laws that are passed, and they're passed in between the years 1935 and 1937. Now keep in mind, look right there, that's two years before World War II even starts. And basically the neutrality acts, which were passed by Congress, was an effort to keep the U.S. out of the potential war that was about to occur in Europe. We want to kind of avoid this madness. We want to stay out, stay out for my sake as well as your own. We want to stay out of this stuff. We want to, you know, we have this Atlantic Ocean in between us and Europe. We want to stay the heck out of this thing. And they pass these acts and they actually do certain things. They look back at kind of the lessons as they saw them of World War I and they came up with a couple of different laws to deal with those lessons. First one, when it came to American ships or nations that are at war, the answer under the Neutrality Acts was... You can't touch this. You can't, can't touch, touch this. this. You can't touch this. And basically what the Act said was no American could sail on a belligerent ship. A nation at war, no person, no American citizen, could sail on a ship of a nation was that, which was at war. And the idea behind this is simple. If Americans are not on ships, for example, the British or the French or whoever happens to be at war, they can't die. And if they can't die, there won't be some outcry as there was when, for example, the Lusitania sunk during World War I. So that was one of the neutrality acts, but they went a step further. Another thing is, and this goes back to the lessons of the Nye Committee, well, what about if a nation is at war and they want to buy American weapons? The answer under the Neutrality Acts is, you can't touch this. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. Under the Neutrality Acts, it outlawed the sale of weapons or loans to any nations that were at war. And this is a, you know, a lesson from World War I, as they saw the lessons of World War I, that we should avoid that there should not be any weapons or loans sold to any nation who is at war. Now, you've got to keep in mind something here. There's no distinction between victim and aggressor. So if a country invades another country, they're at war, they can't get the 
weapons or loans regardless. This is going to be a problem, for example, when Japan invades China. So these neutrality acts were passed with the goal of keeping us out of a potential conflict. Now, back to Europe. Well, what happens is in September of 1939, after all the efforts at appeasement of trying to kind of avoid a war amongst England and the rest of the European powers, Germany invades Poland and... World War II has begun. Um, this war uh, is going to begin in September of 1939. This lecture doesn't focus on that aspect of the war, but basically the strategy of Blitzkrieg, lightning war, quickly defeats most of Europe. Poland falls relatively quickly. Other countries fall very quickly soon after. And what you have is a situation where Hitler, all of those countries in the yellow, have been defeated. Denmark, Norway, Belgium, Holland, and in May of 1940, France. Now at the same time this is going down, in Asia, Japan is expanding as well. Everybody wants to the world. Japan is expanding. In fact, in 1937, they have full-on invasion of mainland China. And all sorts of horrible things happen in that situation. So, in both cases, Roosevelt now is in a situation where the Neutrality Acts do not allow him to get involved. He can't go and help because of, you know, all these prohibitions by Congress. But he doesn't want England or France or China to fall to these aggressor countries. So he gets a policy passed in September 21st, 1939, which would allow to allow the United States to help out the Allies, an amendment to the Neutrality Acts called <coughs> Cash Carry. Cash Carry is a way to help out with, at the same time, trying to avoid getting sucked into the war itself. And here's what it is. Real simple idea. Cash Carry meant Allies could purchase weapons As long as they paid for them in cash and carried them in their own ship. And this policy reflects the public mood of wanting to aid the Allies while staying out of World War II. Now the war has begun. This is Roosevelt and the American public's way of helping without involvement. Direct military involvement. So cash carry is put in place and, uh, you know, We'll see how that works out in just a moment. Um, the concept is simple, though. Help the Allies now to win so our men will never be necessary cash and carry. Now, like I mentioned, Hitler, Italy, Japan are very successful. Blitzkrieg, lightning war, uh, quickly defeats mainland Europe. In June of 1940, uh, France falls to the German war machine. There is Hitler taking a selfie right near the Eiffel Tower. In fact, the fall of France is shocking to many Americans. How did France fall so quickly? Um, and for many Americans, this was a, a wake-up call, especially for Franklin Roosevelt, that this situation needed more U.S. involvement. But the question was how? How were you going to do it without getting involved directly in the fighting? Um, in fact, by September of 1940, you have a situation where country after country has bit the dust. Another one bites the dust. Another one bites the dust. And another one goes. And, and Churchill is the leader of England. Winston Churchill is demanding, pleading for aid from Franklin Roosevelt in the United States because what happens next is Germany begins preparing for a potential invasion of England, of Great Britain. They start bombing. They start bombing England and this, of course, is the very famous Battle of Britain. You know, they have already taken down others from Czechoslovakia, Austria, Poland, Denmark, Norway, Holland, Belgium, France, and now Britain's left to go see the Nazis dentist. The Battle of Britain takes place, we'll cover that in class, and it is the bombing of England. The city of London and other cities are bombed every night for like 70-something days, and 
countless civilians are killed as the German Air Force tries to bomb the country of England into submission. And remarkably, the people of England survive and persevere and do not surrender Winston Churchill um, as their leader. And in September of 1940, while England is being bombed, Roosevelt signs the Selective Service Act, which is the first time ever in our history you have a draft during a time of peace. Under the Selective Service Act, all men between the ages of 21 and 35 years of age had to register for the draft, first time ever that we had this put in place at a time when our country was not at war. So there's this sense that we need to get ready. We need to help out. But there's also this sense that we want to stay out of the fighting. And what you have in the United States is Roosevelt kind of torn between all these different competing interests, the desire to help out the allies, but also the desire to remain neutral. And there's these different organizations that are saying, should we stay or should we go? Darling, you got to let me know. Should I stay or should I go? You know, do we intervene? Do we have non-intervention? Do we remain isolated? What should be the policy of the United States? And like I said, you have groups like Committee to Defend America. And their whole idea was, if we want to avoid the brand, if we want to avoid getting attacked by the Nazis, the only way we're going to do this is if we help out England. By defending the Allies, we defend America. Because they're doing the fight that, that we don't want to. Um, other organizations said, you know what, George Washington wanted us to avoid what he called permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world when he left office in 1796, and that America must kind of stay clear of Europe's problems and Europe's concerns. And you have an organization called the America First Committee, whose whole purpose was very simply America First. We should remain isolationist. We should stay out of Europe's war and we should steer clear of it as best we possibly can. In fact, one of their famous spokespeople, you could see the photo of George Washington in the backdrop, is none other than Mr. Charles Lindbergh, the man who flew across the Atlantic in the 1920s. So this idea of isolationism. Well, Roosevelt's worried and he's worried, justifiably so, that England wasn't going to be able to hang on for too much longer without greater assistance. Cash and carry was having trouble. We'll talk about that in a moment. And he does something called destroyers for bases. And basically, without co getting Congress's approval, which some people didn't like, in September of 1940, he passes a policy where it basically says, hey, England, you have all these bases over in the Western Hemisphere, in the Caribbean. You don't really need them because you're fighting a war over in Europe. We have a bunch of destroyers. Why don't we swap? Why don't we swap these destroyers for bases? So England, you're going to give us bases, for example, in Bahamas or Jamaica or other parts of your former empire. And we'll use those bases for like 99 years. We'll get these air bases and naval bases. And we're going to give you 50 U.S. destroyers like these ones you see right here. Those are going to help you fight the Nazis the naval bases that we're going to get, so we're kind of getting something, we're doing a little swap here, and this angers many isolationists, but he gets enough people to support it, and he goes along, goes along and does it. Now, in the middle of all this, Roosevelt runs for a historic third term. He runs for an historic third term, a whole bunch of issues, press pause, you could read what it says, but basically, Roosevelt wins re-election, Never has been done before, never probably will unless the Constitution is changed. He wins a th third term, and here is his dilemma. He wants to help the Allies, but he doesn't want to send troops and become involved in World War II. The American people, even one month into the war, said, should the U.S. help, do everything possible to help England and France win the war? 62% said yes. Now we're talking 1940 and France has fallen. We want to help, but there's a problem. And the problem with cash carry, it sounds great, and on paper it's a wonderful idea. Pay cash and carry it. But the problem is this. German U-boats 
made traveling the Atlantic Ocean extremely dangerous. England was running out of money. Other countries like China were, were blockaded by Japan so they couldn't get the resources into their country to resist this aggression. You're at war, you don't have time to get you know, these supplies, you don't have the resources to travel across the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific in the case of China. And so what the reality was, was this. The situation in Europe was bad, England was holding on thankfully, but traveling across the Atlantic Ocean, for example England's case, going from here all the way to the United States, I hit. You have sunk my better ship. Was complicated by the presence of these German U-boats. This is one of the few German U-boats that the United States captured in intact. It is in the Museum of Science in Chicago. Fascinating museum. Fascinating visit to go see this U-boat. It's huge. Um, inside the museum, they show you the number of ships sunk by um, the Axis Powers navies. You can see that number only goes up as the war drags on. A lot of wonderful handsome people like this guy risked their lives during World War II and the German U-boat you can go inside it in the museum um, and it's pretty remarkable to see this machine of war. Um, this is the U-boat um, from a different angle torpedoes and basically the situation is this Churchill wants help. Roosevelt can't because of these neutrality acts. Cash carry was only as effective as the cash and the carry capabilities were there and they weren't. And Churchill wants help and Frank has a plan and this is kind of one of those things that happens. Roosevelt says what if we come up with a different plan to replace cash carry and this plan would be really simple. We would get rid of the cash provision. England doesn't have enough money. China doesn't have enough money. We'll get rid of the cash provision. And basically what we will do is we will give, lend the weapons to the Allies so that they can become victorious. All over the place, we will, we will rock you. And this is the Lend-Lease Act, passed in March of 1941. Lend-Lease Act basically is what it says. We would lend the supplies to the Allies, we would get rid of the cash provision, and they would get the planes, the tanks, and the other equipment they need. We, the United States, would become the great arsenal of democracy. We would be the ones fighting by providing the economic means to do the fighting for our friends. In fact, you know, some of the sayings were, send guns, not sons. This Lend-Lease Act is the equivalent of an economic declaration of war. We are not sending soldiers, but we are sending the materials uh, to the Allies. Um, Roosevelt very famously gives this analogy. Pause it and read it. It's kind of funny, but he says it let me break it down in a visual sense. If your neighbor's house was on fire and they ran over to you and asked you to borrow a garden hose so they could put out the fire, you would not tell them, give me money, give me $15 and come get the hose. No, you would be like the brave neighbor. You would lend them the fire hose and allow them to put out the fire. And when the fire's out, they will bring back that hose and give it back. And if it, for some reason, is damaged, they would replace it. This is the concept of Lend-Lease. And Roosevelt, and even though many isolationists were not happy about this, gets this policy put in place, and like a good neighbor, Roosevelt is there. There's Roosevelt and Churchill. Their friendship would be very important throughout the war. We'll talk more about that later. And Lend-Lease supplies begin to flow to the Allies, but overwhelmingly to England, but also China, and eventually the Soviet Union as well. In fact, one of the problems that were ha was happening is Lend-Lease provided the cash solution, but traveling from the east coast of the United States to England was still very dangerous, and German submarines were sinking British ships faster than the supplies could get there. So beginning in April of 1941, Roosevelt begins ordering U.S. tracking 
of German U-boats, and it's called the Allied Convoy System. And we are basically escorting British ships with American war supplies to Europe to help out the Allied powers. Doing everything from escorting to making sure that if submarines are caught, in fact, they had a shoot-on-site order. If any German uh, naval fleets were trying to disrupt the supply, the United States would shoot on site. So what you see happening as time is going on is the United States, because of this fear of an access victory, are slowly becoming more and more involved in the war effort on behalf of the Allies. Here are Here's, here is the uh, Allied convoy system in effect. Hitler makes a mistake, um, and, and he makes a mistake when England fails to surrender, he fails to conquer England, he turns his attention to the east. He turns his attention to the east, and he decides in June of 1941 that him and Stalin, they were never friends, but definitely not now. can't be friends. June 1941, Hitler invades the Soviet Union. Uh, we'll learn more about that later, but basically now the Soviets are in the bed with the Allies. They have now joined forces, even though the U.S. is not officially in the war yet in June. We'll wait until December of 1941, but now Stalin's going to start getting Lend-Lease supplies. The Soviet Union's going to be getting Lend-Lease supplies. England, China, and many other countries. And we'll close it off with a meeting in August of 1941. August of 1941, we have a meeting between Roosevelt and Churchill off the coast of Newfoundland. And these two men, these world leaders, we, the U.S., still technically neutral, and the leader of England, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, come up with a set of goals which would outline what the post-war world was going to look like. And many of these goals may look familiar to Wilson's goals after World War I and his 14 points, but things like no territorial gains, all people should have the right to self-determination, freedom of want, freedom from want and fear, freedom of the seas, disarmament of these aggressor nations, and a new organization that would ensure collective security and world peace. Now we can analyze to what extent they're really going to be pursuing these goals, but the Atlantic Charter, this agreement, this document between Roosevelt and Churchill marks a joint effort at figuring out what this war was going to be about. And by 1941, we are still neutral in the sense of American soldiers are not fighting, but Roosevelt and his administration is fully behind the war effort and the effort to make sure Germany, Italy, and Japan are not victorious by providing the economic and military supplies to stop their advancement. So that closes us out today. This was a lot of information, so go ahead and rewind. Make sure you comment, like the video, subscribe, tell your friends about it, watch it over and over again to help you fall asleep at night. If you have questions, put them in the comment section. I'll be quick to, to respond. And most importantly, Keep in mind, we don't get involved in World War II until the attack on Pearl Harbor, which we'll cover at another time, at another place. Thank you for watching. On a belligerent ship, a nation at war, no person, no American citizen could sail on a ship of a nation was that, which was at war. And the idea behind this is simple. If Americans are not on ships, for example, the British or the French or whoever happens to be at war, they can't die. And if they can't die, there won't be some outcry as there was when, for example, the Lusitania sunk during World War I. So that was one of the neutrality acts, but they went a step further. Another thing is, and this goes back to the lessons of the Nye Committee, well, what about if a nation is at war and they want to buy American weapons? The answer under the neutrality acts is, you can't touch this. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. Under the Neutrality Acts, it outlawed the sale. World War I was a mistake. And if you remember, there were all those writers during the 1920s, the Lost Generation, who, who wrote about the kind of insanity of this war, and people just wanted to avoid it altogether. Here's what happens. 
even before World War II breaks out, Congress, the legislative branch of the U.S. government, legislates neutrality. They pass laws to guarantee that if a war breaks out, that the United States will avoid it. And there's a couple of laws that are passed, and they're passed in between the years 1935 and 1937. Now keep in mind, look right there, that's two years before World War II even starts. And basically the Neutrality Acts, which were passed by Congress, was an effort to keep the U.S. out of the potential war that was about to occur in Europe. We want to kind of avoid this madness. We want to stay out, stay out for my sake as well as your own. We want to stay out of this stuff. We want to, you know, we have this Atlantic Ocean in between us and Europe. We want to stay the heck out of this thing. And they pass these acts and they actually do certain things. They look back at kind of the lessons as they saw them of World War I and they came up with a couple of different laws to deal with those lessons. First one. When it came to American ships or nations that are at war, the answer under the Neutrality Acts was... You can't touch this. You can't, you can't touch, touch this. this. You can't touch this. And basically what the act said was no American could sail... Welcome to this lecture where we're going to take a look at how the United States went from being a bystander nation, sitting on the sidelines, not wanting to get involved in World War II, to actually being a participant or a belligerent power. So let's get this thing started. Um, what you need to realize is there was a lot of a bitterness in the United States regarding our participation in the First World War. Um, World War I was looked upon as a mistake amongst a lot of Americans. In fact, in 1934 to 1936, you have something called the Nye Commission. And I know what you're thinking, Bill Nye, the science guy, awesome, I love him. No, actually, someone even more popular, the Republican Senator, Gerald Nye. And basically what this uh, Senate committee came up with was in their investigation, they basically determined in, in looking at the causes of World War I, why America entered into it, they came up with the conclusion that it was the result of... Money. Hey, must be the money. They basically said that American bankers and arms manufacturers, weapons manufacturers, caused U.S. entry into World War One. That the reason we got dragged into this thing was because of economic factors. That some people made a lot of money off the war, and that this was the main reason. Um, not those things that Wilson talked about making the world safe for democracy, the war to end all wars. That was all hogwash. This was a mistake. In fact, in 1937, they did a poll. 70% of Americans thought we should have stayed the heck out of World War I. So the Nye Commission kind of enforces what people felt.